Hello again, I'm Maurice Barrett and I've got another study in the parables and hard sayings of Jesus. We're up to number 53. It's amazing how many parables there are in the Gospels and, and hard sayings of Jesus. Many things that people don't realise are parables uh, are because a parable is a mystery. It needs explaining, doesn't it? It's a riddle. Jesus talked in riddles. It's amazing that Satan and God both use mysteries to hide the truth from the uninitiated. We know that the devil uses mysteries, but God does. The mystery of iniquity, checking your concordance, the time mysteries are mentioned. Paul says, behold, I'll show you a mystery. We won't all sleep, but we'll be raised. And there's lots of, what's the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a mystery, if you don't know. To the unsaved, there's so many mysteries. And there's so many mysteries to Christians, they don't know the mysteries. They interpret the pa parables to suit the doctrines of the denomination. So I'm looking at a, a riddle. Maybe it doesn't seem like it. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, that's a contradiction, isn't it? That needs explaining. There's no such thing as a light burden. If it's light, it's not a burden. And if a burden, it's heavy. You can't have a light burden, can you? It's a contradiction. No yoke is easy. You're yoked to do work, aren't you? When you've got a yoke on you, it's not easy. It's to pull a cart or whatever. So it's a contradiction. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Well, how can a burden be light? So let's look at it. Let, let's read the scripture that it's taken from. I'm a great believer in uh, the context. It's Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden. So these are people who are burdened. Labour heavy laden. That's a burden, isn't it? Burdened down heavy laden. And I will give you rest. How does Jesus give us rest? Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, that are burdened. Christians are burdened. I've never known so many Christians to be burdened. And I will give you rest. In context, he's not talking to the world, you know. He's talking to God's people. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lonely in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So let's see if I can shed some light on it. Luke 8 verse 10. Because I'm, I'm, I'm impressing you that these mysteries, these riddles are all explainable. The Bible explains the Bible. You don't need a commentary, you know. If you've got something you don't understand, the Bible will interpret the Bible. You just need to know all the scriptures. Compare scripture with scripture. And this is what Jesus said. Because the disciples said, Lord, why do you talk in riddles? Why do you talk in parables? Why don't you tell us plainly? Why t tell us about a sower going to sow and some seed fell on the ground and some fell on the stone and go, well, he's not talking about agriculture, is he? He's not talking about farming. Why, why not tell us what it means? Because Jesus explains it privately to his disciples and said, the, 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 the seed is a, a word of the kingdom, not a word of salvation. It's a word about the kingdom and that the, the it's sown in the heart. So why doesn't he say it straight out? And this is why. He said unto them, unto you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Not mysteries of salvation, not mysteries of eternal life, mysteries of the kingdom. But to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they may not hear. So Jesus told parables so they wouldn't understand, not though so they would. Can you understand? Only those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will understand the mysteries. Jesus many times says, 
after a parable, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, if you've got cloth ears, you won't hear. The letters to the church, he said the same, have something against you to him that overcomes. And every letter to the seven churches, he said that the same to the end of every letter, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, it's a mystery. You won't really know what I'm saying to the churches unless you're initiated, unless you have revelation. So, a burden's heavy, a yoke's not easy, it's hard. So, most believers don't understand the contradiction because they just, my yoke is easy, my burden is like, they never think about it, that it's a contradiction and that it's a riddle, a hard saying. Well, it's an invitation to those who are burdened and tired and the context reveals it's for those who are believers. Jesus wasn't talking to the Gentiles who was talking to God's people who'd been redeemed. Let me read you the verses before because the context is important. He's talking to Christians. That's not a message for the world. Come unto me, all you that labour and heavy laden. That's not a message for the sinners. It's Christ and him crucified. It's about sin and Jesus can have your, uh, you can have your sins forgiven. You can be reconciled to your creator. That's the gospel message. Jesus died for you. This isn't a gospel message. It's not an invitation to the world because they don't know the answer. Uh, uh, an the answer's in the context, I'll show you, and it's for us. So Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 to 27, these are the preceding verses. 28 is my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus prayed. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. That's the world, isn't it? The wisdom of this world. And has revealed it unto babes. There's a clue. You've revealed it to babes. Unless you're childlike, you'll never understand the mysteries. If you use your doctor of divinity and your Bible school education, and your denominational doctrines, you'll never understand the mysteries. You need revelation, just like you do with the devil. Unless you're initiated into the mysteries of the occult, you'll never know them. You can't work it out. So the key is to become like a little child. Even so, Father, for it seemeth good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man but the Father, save the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. That means that he won't reveal it to everyone. You can never know the Father and the Son unless it's revealed to you. You can't find God. You can. People are seeking God. I want truth. Many people in the world are seeking truth. They can't find it because it's not been revealed to them. You know, it's not really part of the study, but I'm going to say it. I've heard people say, you can have as much of God as you want. It's up to you. God wants to give you the fullness. You can have as much of God as you want, as, you, as you're desperate. And they say things like lock yourself in a hotel room and don't come out till God speaks to you. I think that's putting pressure on God. Uh, if I talk to my dad like that, you know, I'd get a thick ear, wouldn't I? I'm not. I'm. I'm not eating any dinners till you till you give me the answer. He'll say, "Eat your dinner, son," and he'll he'll pretend to take his belt off and I'll eat my dinner. You can't put pressure on God. You can entreat God. Of course, people change God's mind by entreating him, by humbling themselves, not by being arrogant and saying, I'm not going till you speak to me. Well, I'm a father and I understand. And I understand about friendship and relationship. I don't care how much you want to know me. It's not dependent on you. It's dependent on me whether I'll let you in. You could desperately want, I really want to know what makes Morris tick. I, I really want to be a, a deep and personal friend with Morris. Well, tough. You're never going to because I'm never going to open my heart to you. I'm not saying that to you. But do you understand? It's up to me. If I don't let you in, you'll never know me. 
If I don't invite you to my home and you see how I treat my wife and my children and you see me how I drive the car, whether I've got road rage or not, you'll never understand me unless you spend time with me. And that's not dependent on you. It's whether I'll give you my time. And, and you can't come to God unless he's willing to accept you. Think about that anyway. No man can come to the Father but the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal it, whoever. Think about that anyway. So the key to this is becoming like a child. You've revealed it, you've hidden it from the those who don't want the truth, and you've revealed it to babes, children. So we've got to have a change of attitude. We've got to have a change of understanding, a change of perception. You know, holiness and Christian life is all about the mind, attitude. Let this mind be in you, this attitude that was in Christ Jesus. So many Christians still have the attitude of the world. They're saved, they read the Bible, but their attitude is wrong. They don't think correctly, they think like the world. Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a doormat. I mean, I mean, they're not doing that to me. I might be Christian, but I'm not stupid. Well, sometimes you've got to be stupid and sometimes you've got to be a doormat. Jesus let him, people crucify him, wicked men crucify him. You know, it, it's, it's not the world's thinking. You've got to become vulnerable like a child. Well, Jesus said, learn of me in the context my yoke is easy, man. Learn of me. So why is Jesus burden light? And why is his yoke easy? He said, learn of me. My burden is light. Why? Because I'm meek and lowly in heart. That's the key. You've got to be meek and lowly in heart. Those are two qualities. Those are the first two beatitudes. Lowly in heart. That's humility, isn't it? Poverty of spirit, lowliness of heart, and meekness. So I'm going to look at those two qualities. I've got whole hour studies on the Beatitudes. I'm, I'm just co covering them briefly here. So Matthew 18, verse 1 to 10. Let's look at it. Well-known passage. We quote this passage at uh, christenings. But it's nothing to do with children. Children are the illustration of grown-ups who become like children. Matthew 18. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Not who's the greatest in eternity. I keep mentioning this because people don't know the difference between eternal life and the kingdom, which is for a thousand years. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst. And he didn't say a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How can a child be the greatest in the kingdom? It's for maturity, isn't it? To reign with Christ. Children don't reign with Christ. Verily I said to unless you're converted, unless you change and become as little children. So it's nothing to do with children. It's saying that grown ups have to become and think and have the attitude of a child. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. So you've got to humble yourself to become a child. Children are not humble. Praise a little child, three years old. Sing a song for your grandma. And he'll sing a song and, oh, that's wonderful. And you'll see his head swell. He's proud he'll strut about and, and want to sing another one. Children are not humble. They're cocky, aren't they, children? They, they, they want attention, don't they? They run round and I, I remember wanting attention, you know, they'll the, the run round without the nappy on, start naked to, 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 to get attention and get you to chase them. They, they... What's the condition of a child? It's not humility, it's vulnerability, vulnerability. A child is vulnerable. That's the condition of a child, and we don't want that. We don't want to be childlike. 
because a child is vulnerable. A three-year-old child, I could beat it to death. He can't defend himself against me. I I'm an old man now, but I could kill a, a three-year-old child with my bare hands. He's vulnerable. I could say to a little girl, come on, darling, here's some sweets and take her away and do some despicable act. She believes in Father Christmas and fairies, so she'll believe me when I tell her, oh, we're going to see some fairies or we're going to do this. And I can do some despicable act with her because they're vulnerable. They need protecting children, don't they? And who wants to become vulnerable? Christians don't. And I know why. Because they don't believe God will protect them. They want to protect themselves. They're not doing that to me. You've got to become vulnerable to be like a child. And then the yoke's easy, the burden's light. But the burden's heavy if you defend yourself. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, humble yourself and become vulnerable. The same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You'll reign with Christ. If you're cocky and proud and you, and you fight your own battles, you'll never reign with Christ. You're following a man who didn't fight his own battles. Jesus said, I could call legions of angels to deliver me, but he didn't. He was a fool to the world because he died when he didn't have to. He didn't have to die. He gave himself. That was stupid to common sense, isn't it? He became vulnerable. He was despised, rejected. And whosoever shall receive one such child in my name receiveth me. If you accept a vulnerable Christian, you accept Christ. But if you offend one of these little ones, it's better that a millstone will hang round your neck and you are drowned in the depths of a sea. That's serious. You know, you don't float with a millstone around your deck. Have, have you seen a millstone? They're big. Limestone or granite or whatever. They just sink like a, like a millstone. I mean, they just, as soon as they hit the water, they just go down, right down. If you've got a millstone around your deck, that's it. And he says, if your hand offend you, cut it off. Cut it off if you're going to offend one of these little ones. Not children. Grown-ups, Christians who become vulnerable like a little child. They're angels are ever beholden the Father. We think that's about children. It's not children. Read the context. It's about Christians who become vulnerable and humble yourself like a child and become vulnerable. God protects those who are like that. So humility... John Wesley's definition, and I've borrowed it or use it, it's a correct view of yourself. It's knowing yourself. A proud man doesn't know himself. He thinks himself more highly than he ought. He thinks he's great when he's, a, he's dust with a suit on, isn't he? He came from dust and he's going back to dust. He's going to die. And they'll put him naked in a coffin and he can't take his wealth with him and his pride with him. Everyone dies a beggar and destitute and humbled. You know, if you don't humble yourself now, death will humble you. You'll come back to dust. And that's you, finished in the grave. Your spirit lives on, but, you know, a proud man doesn't know himself. Because he's deceived himself and thinks he's better than what he is. A humble man doesn't mind being accused of being proud. If you get a humble man and you say, oh, you're proud, he'll say, yeah, I know. But you tell a proud man he's proud. I told my boss once, he was a very arrogant, proud, avaricious man. And I said, well, you're very proud, Harold. He says, I'm not proud, son, I'm just full of character. Proving he was proud. His chest went up when he was telling me. I'm, I'm, it's funny, isn't it? Humility is a correct view of yourself. You're just a sinner saved by grace, aren't you? It, it's that God loves you. It's not that you're worthless, but you need to know your true state. You need to know that you don't know your own heart. Well, my motives are pure. Oh, no, they're not. Nobody's motives pure. Nobody seeks after God. 
the heart's deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. So the most deceitful, desperately wicked thing on the planet is my heart and yours. You don't know it. You know what you think, but you don't know why you think it. That's your subconscious. The Bible calls the, the heart the subconscious thinking. That's where your passions, your emotions, your secret desires, your lusts, your pride, that's all in your heart. And you don't know it. The Bible says you don't know it. Solomon said when he prayed and said, Lord, will you forgive us if we uh, repent when he dedicate the temple? For you alone know the hearts of men. David didn't say, search my mind, God. You can search your own mind. You know what you think. He said, search my heart because he doesn't know it. Search me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Yeah. We don't know our own heart, you see. So you need a true definition of yourself, a, a true understanding. That's humility. Let me read Romans 12. Verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. And what's the next one? And don't be conformed to this world. How, how do you change? But be transformed, be changed from the thinking of the world. How? By a renewing of the mind. Change your attitude. For I, This is the next verse. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that's among you. So the first, if you read Romans 12, I wrote 36 ways to renew your mind. Uh I won't go through them because I can't remember that I'm after look at the scripture. But I wrote 36 little numbers in Romans 12 because it says renew your mind. Then it tells you how to renew your mind. And the first one, for I say to everyone that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, that's pride, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Every Christian thinks they're a man of faith a woman of faith, and it's nonsense. I've never seen so much lack of faith in Christians. They taught faith, but they can't live it. When the trials come, when they're sick, when problems come, they don't show faith, they show fear. They run round to the world for help. They run round to the doctor. They, they run round to the government for help. They've not got faith. They, they believe in miracles, but they, they don't see them. They say, well, all things are possible, but they don't raise the dead and cast out devils, the, the ordinary Christians, do they? They say it's for everyone, we should all be laying hands on the sick and recover, but they, they don't do it, it doesn't happen. Even ministers, the percentage of people who get healed is, is a pathetic. I'm talking about people with cancer and people with withered arms and people with blind, people with no eardrums, why aren't they? I grew up in revival when my dad prayed for people. They got new eardrums. People who were deaf from birth, new eardrums, new organs put in the body. That, that's the power of God. We think it's wonderful if a headache goes, but that can be psychosomatic, can't they? You will be healed, you will be healed, say it again. You will be healed, I am healed, I am healed. That's brainwashing. You don't need to hype up faith. You just speak the word and it should happen. But, but I don't see it. I don't see it. Everyone's talking it and, and people aren't living it. Well, Paul's got a wonderful definition of humility. He calls it lowliness. I am meek and lowly, Jesus said. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. Ephesians 4 2. He's telling us how to live. These are attitudes with all lowliness and meekness with long-suffering preparing one another in love. This is all about character, the ways of thinking, with all lowliness, not thinking of yourself more highly than you are, meekness, and I'm talking about meekness in a minute, with long-suffering preparing one another in love. And Philippians 2 verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, that's pride, vain glory, glory in when it's worthless, but in lowliness of mind, attitude let each esteem each other greater than themselves well that's ridiculous i can't esteem this christian better than me because he's not 
He's only been safe three weeks and he still smokes and I hear him using the F word and he still gets drunk on a Friday night. I know he's saved, he's, he's, but, you know, he's not better than me. Because I've been a Christian 20 years and I don't drink now and I don't smoke and I don't get drunk on a Friday night. I wonder how God compares the two of us. This new convert, who's still raw from the world, is a baby. Yeah. You don't criticise babies, do you? You let them play with the toys, you let them poo in the nappies, and you mess them up, you've cleaned them up. Of course he's a new Christian, of course he's, you, you've got to mess, clean up his mess, haven't you? And help him, and he's a baby. What about me? Well, I've been a Christian 30 years, you see, but I've left my first love. I'm a humbug and a hypocrite because I, t I know it all. I know all my doctrines, but I'm still full of pride and lust and things that nobody can see. My wife doesn't know me. She doesn't know if I'm lustful because it's in the heart. She doesn't know whether I'm proud because I've learned to act humble. Christians learn to act humble. Oh, well, all glory to God. But you can't see my heart swelling. Can you? Oh, my head swelling because it, it's not physical. It's so easy. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem each other better than themselves. So God may say that new convert's better than you, Morris, because you're a hypocrite. He's not a hypocrite, he's just a baby. You know, you can learn something off everyone. I learned that as a musician. You know, you can learn off a bad musician because you can learn that's not the way to do it. You know, if you're a drummer and you watch drummers and you think, oh, he's not as good as me, maybe he's not. But maybe you can learn, so maybe the way he holds his sticks or maybe the way he set his drums up. You can learn off anyone if you're willing to learn. If you think you know it, then you know nothing as you ought to know. That's what Paul said. If you think you know anything, you know nothing as you ought to know. So as a musician... You've got to realise you can learn off anyone. Esteem each other as greater than yourself. If you saw them as God saw them, maybe we'd change our attitude and not be so judgmental. We've got to judge sin in the church, but don't judge people's character. You don't know it. Well, we all need new clothes. Let me read 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Can you see it's all about attitude, pride? I'm not submitting to him. He's only 33, that pastor, I'm 50. Why should I submit to him? Yea, all be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. That's a wonderful phrase. Put it on. Don't let them see your pride and your hypocrisy. Clothe yourself with humility. Put it on like a garment. Protect yourself so that people see Jesus in you and not you. Goodness me, you would never come and hear me preach if you knew me. My old nature. I worked with gangsters 14 years so that God could show me that I was a gangster inside. You wouldn't like me. If you see any good in me, it's not me, it's Christ. Morris is dead, I hope, that old man. If you see any good in me, it's not me. There's no good thing in the flesh. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Thank God and you don't have to come and listen to me or see me. All right, humility, I've talked about that. The other quality is to not have a burden is meekness. I am meek and lowly. We've looked at lowliness. Meekness, not weakness. People think that meekness is weakness. Well, a little meek old lady wouldn't say boo to a goose, little mousy. Meekness is a tremendously strong quality. It's a fruit of the spirit. And it's taking the pressure and submitting when you have power to resist. If you've no power to resist, then you're not 
That doesn't go. But when you've got power to get revenge, when you've got power to stand up and say, you're not doing this to me, and you submit, that's meekness. A good illustration, I suppose. I'm not a giant, am I? I'm only five foot two and my stocking soles dripping wet, I suppose. But imagine I'm walking down the road and there's this big six foot six man plays rugby and it, it, I'm going mad in my own business. And he said, who are you looking at, you little squirt? <laughs> and I say, I, I wasn't looking at anyone. And he hits me and knocks me down to the ground. Well, he doesn't know I'm a double, treble, quadruple black belt. I could eat three of them for breakfast. That's not, not me. Uh, but I'm, I'm role-playing. I could eat three of him. I could touch one nerve in his neck and paralyse him. So I, I have no fear of him. If I decide, I have nothing to prove. He's maybe had a bad day. He's maybe his wife sent him with a thick ear and no sandwiches to work. I don't know. Maybe he's had a bad day. I don't need to fight. I have nothing to prove. And I walk away. He'll look at me and think, huh, silly little mug, scared of me. He thinks I'm weak, but actually I'm meek because I had power to resist. I could have destroyed him, but I chose not to to resist. Do you understand when I had power to? Now, if I'm scared of him and I walk away, that's not meekness. That's because I'm a coward. I'm, I'm, I'm frightened. But when I have the power to, to retaliate and you don't, that's meekness. And we don't want to do that. You know, when somebody's wronged us, Christians, they, they say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, so I better not get revenge. God, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. We want God to hit them with a brick instead of us. <laughs> Don't we? We think, you know, and then, forgive me saying it, but I've thought these things, and maybe you have. You know, six weeks later, they have a car crash. And you think, I knew God would get them. You know, when bad things happen to your enemies, do you rejoice over it and think, well, I, I didn't touch them, but God's got them. Pray that God will be merciful and not punish them for hurting you. What did Stephen say? They were killing him. They were stoning him to death. And what did Stephen say? Don't lay this sin, this sin, to their charge. The good to the lake of fire for all the sins, but not, not for stoning me. Don't lay this sin to the charge. He forgave them for stoning him. That's amazing, isn't it? We've got examples in the Bible, you see, of people who were meek. That's meekness. Jesus was meek. He could have called the legions of angels. I've said it. Well, it's a quality of character, not personality. Nobody's meek by character. You may be quiet by personality. I'll just tell you how I see personality and character. Personality is what God's given you to express yourself. So in the animal kingdom, we've got a lion and the man's got a lovely mane. That impresses people. The lioness is not so colourful or extravagant. A crow, it's black and it's not got a nice car. That's all it can say. A robin or a nightingale's got beautiful colours and they've got a warble, haven't they? A beautiful nightingale. That's just what God's given them. One's not better than the other. A crow's not better than a nightingale. They've just got different personalities. It's the way they express themselves. And that's us. Don't try and change your personality. There's nothing wrong with it. It's perfect. It's who uses it. Whether God uses your personality or Satan, but your personality is perfect. There's nothing, no defects in your personality. Some people are quiet and they want to dress in black and browns and dark blues, and other people want flamboyant colours. Don't criticise each other. You ought to bright yourself up. And you, you, you should sober yourself a bit. You're too, you know, you've got, got bright yellow hair. What, what, what are you trying to prove? You're not trying to prove anything. You're expressing yourself with what God's given you. That's all right. Character, you're not born with a character. You have to develop your character. You teach children character, don't you? They cry because they want the food. No, you have to wait. I want my dinner now. No, wait. 
You have to teach them patience. You have to teach them selflessness. It's mine. No, share it with your brother. No, it's mine. Share it with your brother. It's my sweets. No, share them with your brother. You have to teach them manners. You have to teach them character. And as a Christian, I don't find that churches are teaching people the Christian character. It's a completely different character than the world, you know. We have the mind of Christ. That changes your character. The mind of the world makes you the character of the world. I don't think there's any such thing as Christian culture. Because you're not born with a culture. You're born into a culture, aren't you? Do you understand? If I, if I take a little child from Africa at six weeks old and bring him to England, he'll grow up with an English culture. He'll think like an Englishman. He won't think like an African, will he? Because Africa's not gone in, so Africa can't come out. He won't speak Swahili. He'll speak English and he'll think like an Englishman. And the same is if I had a six-week-old baby and, and took it to India and they brought it up, it would think like an Indian and speak Hindi, wouldn't it? Or Talagu or whatever language is in India. You're born into a culture. That's not, there's no such thing as Christian culture, there's only Christian character. So we're all the same, aren't we? It's a level play. You get rid of your culture and get the character of Christ, then it doesn't matter whether you're African, Indian, English, French, it doesn't matter what you are because we all have the same character, the kingdom character, not kingdom culture. I know pastors use that word and I'm not criticising them for using it, but for me, it's more about character. The culture's a bit nebulous, you know, it's a bit, uh, it's not fixed, is it? The character of Christ is fixed. It's, it's in the Bible. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, gentleness, peace, long-suffering. That's not culture, that's character and the Beatitudes. Isaiah 61. This is a prophecy about Jesus. This is what Isaiah prophesied and Jesus quoted it in Luke 4 when he went to the temple. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. Oh, Not good tidings to the proud, not good tidings to everyone, no. The proud have cloth ears, they can't hear it. They won't discern it. I've come to bring good tidings to the meek, those who don't defend themselves, those who are teachable. Meek means submissive or teachable. To bind up the broken hearted. And uh, the Pharisees weren't teachable. That's why he didn't teach them. That's why he spoke in riddles and parables. He said, to you disciples, it's to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, meaning the Pharisees, not the world, because Jesus didn't come to the Gentiles, that God's people, who were Pharisees and didn't want the truth, he said it's not for them, because they're not meek, they're not teachable. Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou in to them in parables? This is the God's people. So meekness is not acceptance. It's a choice to submit. So you're not accepting it. Oh, well, I'll accept it. You choose to submit. And it's not retaliating when you have power to retaliate. And it often seems as weakness. Can you come and do this illustration, Johnny, with the hands? I, I find this... Uh, such a good illustration uh, and I've used it a few times I hope I get it right make sure we're on the camera right put your hand up okay <laughs> what did you feel you pushing pressure she felt pressure because I was pushing all right don't resist me you're my wife, don't resist me. She felt no pressure. Why? Because she wasn't resisting. Resist again. <laughs> Can you understand? Very profound. Because the pressure you feel is proportionate to the resistance you put up. 
Let me say that again. The pressure you feel is only the resistance that you put up. If you put no resistance, how can you feel pressure? Jesus never resisted anything. In all things, give thanks, that's the will of God. Why fight it? Why fight the devil? Why do Christians fight the devil? In all things, give thanks, Lord, this stinks. I'm sure the devil sent it, but it's all right. I'm not resisting it, Lord. I put myself in your hands. Why not throw yourself on God's mercy when trials come? There's no scripture to say we should fight the devil. If you think there is, please email me and... We cast devils out, not fight them. If you've got power, you don't fight them, do you? I don't fight my son because I've got power over him. Go and do this, son. I don't want to. You get. He'll do what I say till he's grown, till he's a grown man, and then he can fight me. But when he's a child, because I've got power over him. I can tell him to do what he doesn't want to do. I want you to do this errand. I don't want to go an errand. I'll say, well, you're jolly well going, son. There's the money. Off you go. When you've got power over the devil, you don't fight him. You cast him out. Do you understand? Get out in the name of Jesus and don't manifest. That's what Jesus did. We don't have to fight the devil. You resist the devil when he comes in and he'll flee, but you don't fight. That's not fighting him, is it? All things work together for good to those that love God. The things that you like, the things that you don't like, the disasters, the problems, they're all working for your good because you're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And God's a good father. So whatever happens to you in your life, I don't care what it is before you are saved, after you are saved, it's all to make you the bride of Christ. It's all to conform you to the image of his soul. That's why I predestined you. So what you've been through is the easiest, not the hardest. I don't give my son six of the best when he only needs two. And I don't give him two of the best when he only needs a word. You need to pick your socks up, son. I don't strap him if he, if he just needs a word. And, and God is the good father, so he'll only do what you need. So anything you've been through is necessary to conform you to the image of his son. The, you know, the trials are a blessing in disguise. Trials are a blessing in disguise because we can learn from our trials. You don't learn anything from your success. Success gives you a big head, doesn't it? Trials give you a big heart. They break you and... and and that's how we minister. We don't minister out of ego. We minister out of brokenness. Unless you break the bread, how many will you feed? If this is a, a loaf of bread and I tear it in two, I'll feed two people. The more I break it, the more I'll feed. Jesus was broken on the cross and he fed the whole world. We've got to be broken. It's not about ego and knowledge and doctrine. It's about brokenness, being humiliated and understanding well, Jesus said, my yoke's easy, my burden's light, because I'm meek and lowly. Just two of those characteristics, two of the fruit of the Spirit, two of the Beatitudes. Well, Matthew eleven twenty-five to 30, let's read it again. And Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. That's the Pharisees, the people who've got all the doctrines right. And has revealed them unto babes, those who are vulnerable. Even so, Father, it seemed good in your sight. It's God's plan. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden. I must emphasise he's talking to the body of Christ, not the sinners and i'll give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me get yoked to me follow jesus for i am meek and lowly in heart that's the key and you'll find rest for your soul my yoke is easy my burden is light he's not heavy he's my brother do you remember the song you know th this is a Carrying a bag of coal, you know, half a mile, it's heavy. 
if your child who weighs the same weight as a bag of coal and is dying of uh, is dying and you're rushing him to hospital and people say do you want any help no it isn't it heavy no it's my child you, you won't let go of him it's your attitude that makes it heavy or light my yoke is easy my burden is light so the only way to have an easy yoke and a light burden is to develop, develop these attitudes, humility and meekness. They're not qualities we possess. This is my last statement. You know, the world want the, the Beatitudes. Bernard Shaw, the agnostic, he said, the Sermon on the Mount's wonderful. He said, it's fantastic teaching. He said, if I can find a Christian living it, I'd become a Christian. You see, the world want the, 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 the characteristics, don't they? Oh, give me peace. That's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Oh, give me peace. The woman in the supermarket, she's wheeling a trolley with a little kid. I, I'm getting the beans, Mum. All right, and he picks the beans from the bottom of the thing and 500 cans of beans all go over the floor and she's what does she do she looks up to heaven oh give me patience she never looks at the floor and says give me patience isn't it amazing they know where it comes from they never say oh give me they say oh give me patience they look up as though so something's there give me pay see they want patience god will never give you the quality because you'll use it don't pray for more love will you I need more love, because when if God gives you more love, then you can love who you want. I need more patience, then you're patient with the people you like, and then patient with those you don't. They're not qualities we possess, it's qualities we manifest because we have Christ. It's a, a fruit of Christ's spirit, not ours. The modern versions are terrible in that they, they change the scriptures, and they don't talk about... Uh, temperance they talk about self-control that's a terrible translation self-control because anything with self in front is wrong self-esteem self-righteousness self-satisfaction deny self self's supposed to be dead isn't it i'm temperate i'm balanced because christ is in me not because i'm controlling myself if self changes self it's self-righteousness do you understand? Self can't change self. You need more of Jesus. He's the quality. More of Jesus means more compassion. More of Jesus means more meekness, more humility, more peace, more love, more joy. It's the person you want, not the quality. Because the world want the qualities. I want joy. I want peace. I want patience. I want love. All we need is love. The Beatles sang it. But it's so they can control it. See, if... You have more of Jesus, it's not nice. Because you'll love people you don't like. So if you have the love, you can love who you want. But if, if you have more of Christ, you'll love people you don't like. You'll be submissive when you want to retaliate because you've got Christ. It's not you. You can't live the Christian life. You can only be a hypocrite. You need more. He lives his life through you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You need more of Jesus, not more of the qualities. So don't pray for more peace, more joy, more love. Pray for more of Jesus. And you manifest all the fruit of the Spirit. So, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. That's humility, vulnerability. And don't fight your own battles. Stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. We all say that. Don't fight. Stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. But we all want to fight our own battles, don't we? And struggle and fight Satan. Relax. You know, we should have a, a carefree life. Be careful for nothing. That's an amazing statement. Don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in all things, give thanks. We should have a carefree life. Despite the circumstances, we go through hell and high water in this earth, don't we? You know, there's Christians die of cancer, there's Christians get divorced, and, you know, Christians fall, and there's all sorts of things. But none of these things should move us because we have more of Christ. Lord, please help us. 
I know your yoke is easy and your burdens light, but it's we want so much to do our own thing. We want to live the Christian life. And we can't do it, Lord. I've re realised I can never be the Christian. I need more of Christ and he'll live his life in my body. And I'll have a carefree life and my yoke will be easy. My burden will be light because of the right attitude. Help us, Father. I ask it in your name. God bless you. There's another parable coming up. There's another 20 or 30 yet. So tune into this channel. Have a wonderful week. God bless.